Okay, we're gonna get started. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amy O'Hara. I'm a research professor at the Massive Data Institute at Georgetown's McCourt School of Public Policy and president of APDU, the Association of Public Data Users. Welcome to our webinar this afternoon. And before we begin, I wanna remind you that this webinar is being recorded. Everyone will receive an email early next week with a link to this recording. Uh, we'll also send along the slides and any resources that we discussed today. Uh, the recording and slides will also be posted to the website. So now that we have that out of the way, I am thrilled to be your moderator as we talk about the results of one of the many initiatives we have at the Massive Data Institute, which is our Place-Based Indicators Project. This project aims to help local leaders understand and use administrative data to answer important questions about their communities. So we all know that there's lots of data collected by governments, by commercial organizations every day, and that data could be repurposed to help us gain new insights into what's going on in our communities and to help us develop possible solutions to problems we might be having. So as we think about all the existing data out there, there's a lot that could be used to help guide housing policy and program design and evaluation. We wanted to demonstrate how these innovative uses of administrative data could help communities as they grapple with issues like housing shortages, evictions, the aging housing stock, homelessness, and much more. So we were commissioned to uh, develop a symposium for HUD, Housing and Urban Development's journal called Cityscape. It just came out this spring. The title is on the screen in front of you. It's called Local Data for Local Action, and it features 25 articles in the symposium that look at how communities can create place-based indicators and other insights using administrative data. So that can help them guide their decision-making, understand the impact of different programs they have, and we are very excited today to have the authors of three of these papers with us to discuss what they did and what their findings were. So first we'll hear from Michael Henderson from Case Western Reserve University, who will talk about his work that used parcel data, property tax rolls, deed and foreclosure records, housing code violations, building permits, and even more data sources uh, to understand the lead risk in Cleveland, Ohio's rental housing. His research study guided the city's lead safe housing strategy and that research is now being used to evaluate the city's progress toward reducing lead hazards. Next, Sarah Duda from DePaul University's Institute from Housing Studies will discuss her paper that used parcel data to understand why neighborhoods throughout Chicago have lost so many small-scale multi-home buildings. These are buildings with two to four units that were really popular among first-time home buyers and middle-income households because they're more affordable. So their research points to the role that gentrification and disinvestment have played in the loss of this crucial part of the housing market. Last but not least, we've got Max Griswold from RAND, who will talk about how he and his team used data on evictions from four California locations to see how many people were evicted from rental homes that had been certified crime-free. So these findings indicate that crime-free housing policies, which have been growing in popularity, can significantly increase evictions. So we are gonna take questions after each presentation. So please use the Q&A button that you see at the bottom. You can drop your questions in there during at, at any time during the presentation and our speakers will do the best to respond to them uh, in the time that we have today. So I can't wait for these discussions to begin and I'm gonna take it, turn it over to Michael to take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, really happy to be here. Um, I'm Michael Henderson. I'm a research associate at the Center on Poverty and Community Development at Case Western. Um, and today I'm really happy to have the chance to uh, discuss with or share with uh, with everyone some of the probably some of the most important research I've ever had the chance to work on. Um, and so uh, we can move on to the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so very briefly, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the context that explains and uh, uh, justifies this research that I'm going to discuss today, uh, which is focused on uh, the significant longstanding problem of lead poisoning in Cleveland's children uh, associated with the deteriorated housing stock 
Um, and then uh, after that, I'll jump into the, our research, which focused on using local data um, to uh, support this really ambitious multi-partner effort to eliminate uh, rental uh, sources of lead poisoning uh, in the rental housing stock in Cleveland. Um, next slide. So just for some context, um, being exposed to lead, especially as a young child, uh, is really well known to have, um, it, it, that it can have uh, long-term deleterious consequences, um, including cognitive dis deficits, uh, it can, and uh, behavioral and social problems that can be persistent, uh, not just through childhood, but through throughout life. Um, and Ohio is already already has higher than average rates of lead poisoning in their child population. Um, and unfortunately, Cuyahoga County and its city center of Cleveland is kind of the epicenter of uh, the lead poisoning problem in Ohio. Uh, just to drive that point home, um, in 2021, 14% uh, of all children under age six that were tested in Ohio were from Cuyahoga County, uh, but the same Cuyahoga County children accounted for 41% of all cases of uh, uh, elevated blood lead level um, results. <clears throat> so, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, you know, the, the problem the dangers of being exposed to lead and also the high rates of lead poisoning in Cleveland uh, have both long been known, but uh, in the mid 2010s, uh, a few different kind of threads uh, focused on this issue kind of started to come together, uh, ultimately culminating in 2019 when uh, Cleveland City Council passed an ordinance that would require every uh, privately owned a rental unit built before 1978 in the city to be uh, inspected uh, and any sources of lead uh, exposure to be remediated or mitigated or eliminated, uh, and then to receive a lead safe certification. Um, and then another part of this uh, this ordinance was that involved the it required the appointment of a lead safe auditor and a lead safe advisory board to uh, support and monitor the progress of the city towards this goal of eliminating uh, sources of lead exposure in the rental housing stock. And that's where we come in. My research center, we were appointed the lead auditor and we're also involved on the advisory board. And so this has really been a big part of our work over the last few years and continues to be so. Next slide, please. So, uh, just from the outset of this initiative, uh, the first thing that we needed to know in order to uh, uh, devise good, useful strategies for uh, uh, making it possible to actually eliminate lead in rental housing was to know what the rental housing stock in the city looks like and also who owns all the rental properties in the city. And so that was our first uh, uh, job, uh, at least my first job, uh, uh, in, involved with this uh, work. Um, so the first part of our work was to identify the entire rental universe in Cleveland. Um, there are some rental properties that are known because they are, the city of Cleveland has a rental registration uh, requirement, uh, but then it's also known that there are many other properties that act as rentals, but that aren't in compliance with this rental registration. Um, so we identified these kind of shadow probable rentals uh, primarily through Cuyahoga County Fiscal Office records as the county auditor. Um, we flagged properties that were multifamily residential um, or that were single family properties that do not claim this uh, owner occupancy tax credit uh, as, as most likely being rental properties. Um, and then we also did use other administrative data sources to narrow down um, the, the data, uh, the rental universe, I'm sorry, so that it only included uh, active pre-1978 privately owned rental properties. Next slide, please. And through this process, we identified 54,786 uh, 
properties in the pre-1978 rental universe uh, as of 2018. That was kind of our uh, reference time for this study. Um, we found that uh, really only 30% of all rental properties in the city were actually in compliance with the city's uh, rental registry. Um, so for lots of uh, uh, un un unaccounted for rental properties in, in, in Cleveland. Um, we also found a wide variety of uh, the, in the types of rental properties, but there were you know, significant uh, percentages of properties that were in bad condition um, that were uh, have had their very low value, which in Cleveland we're defining as uh, below $25,000 assessed market assessed market value. Um, <clears throat> and uh, also a significant number that uh, have had where the, the property owners probably experiencing some financial distress as well uh, with recent tax delinquency. Uh, next slide. And we can see that the distribution of distressed uh, rental properties is uh, uh, shows some very uh, distinct patterns. Uh, those here, those kind of the darker red Dots are low value uh, rental properties below $25,000. And then we could slide through these next three slides pretty quickly here. Uh, this next one uh, shows uh, there's a citywide property inventory that was carried out in 2015. Um, these are the properties that were rental properties that were graded a CD or an F. Uh, these are the property rental properties that have that had a uh, tax delinquency of greater than $500 in the previous year. Um, and we're all, and then this combines those three measures of uh, distress together. And you can see these deeper shades of pink are, are areas, uh, are properties experiencing multiple types of distress. Um, and you know, this, this really, oh, and then if we go to the next slide, it closely mirrors uh, the places that are associated with uh, lead poisoning events in children. Um, and I should also point, these same highlighted areas on the east side of Cleveland uh, are uh, places that were uh, redlined back in the 1930s and that have for decades been subject to uh, chronic disinvestment and uh, the, and, and you know, maintaining the housing stock. I'm, I'm good to go. Okay. So having figured out, identified all the properties that are in the rental universe in Cleveland, we then moved on to trying to identify all the unique landlords in Cleveland, which was actually a much bigger lift. Um, basically, we had to reshape the parcel level rental universe database into a landlord level file consisting of one record for each unique landlord in the city with information about uh, the number, location, and types of properties that they own. Uh, this is a big challenge because, uh, you know, a, a single person can own multiple properties under any number of different LLCs or just variations of their own name. Uh, and it's not immediately clear. And sometimes it's impossible to know who actually is the person behind an LLC or who actually owns a property. So we did our... Uh, uh, with the information we had available, we did our best to kind of deduplicate this, uh, all the landlords and associate them across the properties that they might own. And we relied primarily on property owner name and the tax mailing address from the Cuyahoga County Fiscal Office um, tax file. And I think, uh, I don't know, I'm guessing I'm probably running a little bit low on time here, so we can, oh yeah, here we go. <clears throat> yes. Okay. So in the end, uh, we basically just compared every name, every unique name every against every other unique name uh, in the rental universe. And eventually we identified uh, around 37,000 unique landlords in Cleveland. And then we carried out a latent class analysis to identify distinct types of landlords that might need different types of uh you know, loan and grant pro uh, programs and different carrots and sticks to get them to comply with the lead safe uh, requirements. And we can just uh, go ahead. Maybe let's just skip ahead two slides. We identified three different types of landlords 
Um, there's one in particular uh, that are basically what we would call mom and pop landlords. They own pretty much one property. Uh, they're operating as themselves, as people, rather as in a corporate entity. Um, and their properties are overwhelmingly in bad condition with high rates of tax delinquency and other signs of distress. And we can see these here, this final map shows the, the density curves show areas with uh, high levels of distress and the points are the locations of these high need landlords. So uh, all, all this research came together to, that's, and it really has and continues to inform the rollout and implementation of this lead safe strategy. So I'll just leave it at that. That's great, thanks. Uh, there's a question in the, the, in the Q&A asking, how do you determine that the housing units had bad conditions? So there are a couple of different data sources we use for that. Um, one is the from the, the county auditor. Uh, they they you know they um, you know they give assign grades to every property in the city for calculating you know property tax rates. Um, but then also there was this um, organization called the Western Reserve Land Conservancy in Cleveland, and also they worked with the city of the city's Department of Building and Housing to carry out a really intense external survey of every single parcel in the city. Uh, they did it in 2015, and then they just completed another one, uh, citywide property survey in 2023 again, um, to, yeah, and again, assign grades. You know, I know those grades are, can be problematic, but uh, that, that those were the data sources we had and that we used. Another question in the chat. Uh, what were some of the mechanisms that were considered to get higher compliance among landlords to register their properties? Well, you know, the main mechanisms that have been used. So I think I don't I, I don't know what the last count is, but I think there's been over one hundred and twenty million dollars raised to actually see this effort come to a successful conclusion of, you know, you know, no you know, lead safe housing in Cleveland. Um, so making grants available so that, you know, there are lots of folks in Cleveland who rent properties that aren't rich. They can't afford necessarily to put tens of thousand dollars into replacing all the windows and the porch of their house that has a, you know, assessed market value of $35,000, you know, so, so making the resources available is has been one of the main um, mechanisms they've used to get compliance. But then also, there have been other mechanisms, and in, including uh, uh, allowing the city to basically and create. It, it, I guess the city has been given additional enforcement mechanisms as well. Uh, the next question in the chat, where's the city at in terms of using this information to directly contact landlords to increase compliance? Um, I don't know. I can't necessarily speak to the degree that they've used this directly. I, I do know we we have a pretty good working relationship with the Department of Building Housing, which is kind of at the center of uh, this effort. And um, I know that when we first conducted the, this identified this rental universe, they went out and actually like double checked a lot of our work because, you know, for every one registered rental in the city, uh, there were more than three unregistered rentals. And uh, I know they, they helped validate our work and they saw that we did, we were able to find lots of clear, clearly obvious rental properties that just were kind of off the grid. So. Thank you. Uh, there's another question that's in the Q&A, but I'm going to flip over to Sarah's presentation. Michael, if you wouldn't mind taking a look at the Q&A at Shannon's question uh, and trying to hopefully get an answer to her, if that's... Yeah, I will I will do that. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks again, everyone. I appreciate it. Great. Um, next, we're going to hear from Sarah. Hello. Good afternoon. Just wait for my presentation to come up. Um, next slide, please. So I'm Sarah Duda. I'm the deputy, deputy director at the Institute for Housing Studies uh, in Chicago. Um, 
And our mission is to provide reliable and timely data and information to inform housing and community development policy and practice. We accomplish this through an applied research model that's really grounded in community engagement. Um, and that what that means is really just meaningful participation from community partners is really critical to all aspects of our work. Um, and if you're interested in some like-minded entities, I would encourage everyone to, to look at Urban's uh, National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership, NIP. Uh, we are the Chicago partner. And there are lots of great uh, research organizations doing really important work as data intermediaries um, all over the country. So take a, take a peek. So my presentation is on um, really the, what we saw in the city of Chicago in terms of the lost two to four unit housing stock. And the paper that I'm gonna be talking about is one that I worked on with my colleagues, Jeff Smith um, and Yuan Zhao at the Institute for Housing Studies at DePaul. Next slide. So for some background first, um, the lost affordable rental supply is really a critical issue uh, nationwide. Um, and when we think about what might be sort of a component of that affordable rental supply in many cities, uh, small rental units uh, found in two to four unit buildings are a really critical um, part of that lower cost rental stock. Um, in Chicago, two to fours are really um, part of the iconic uh, city of Chicago housing supply, like along with the bungalow. Uh, when you think of city of Chicago neighborhoods, you think of sort of two to fours and bungalows. And they're also the backbone of um, our uh, lower cost rental stock in most markets that is uh, uh, unsubsidized. We know from our research that these buildings tend to be older. Um, they tend to serve um, the lowest income households because often they provide the lowest rents. And they're providing really relative affordability in a lot of different neighborhood contexts all over the city. Um, compared to other uh, multifamily housing, they tend to provide a larger units, so more bedrooms, so they're family sized. Uh, they tend to be more mom and pop owned by long term owners um, who might occupy a unit. And when we look at sort of the, um, the composition of who lives in two to fours, both renters and owners, they're also um, really important and critical both for homeowners of color and renters of color. Um, some of our research on using Humda data has shown that two to fours are a particularly important pathway for home ownership for uh, modest income Black and Latino home buyers. Uh, so really important stock is what I hope I've emphasized. And we're losing it. Um, community partners first raised this issue that we're losing two to fours way back in 2014. Um, and since then, we have iterated on all different types of uh, analysis to really be able to, and, and technical assistance, to really kind of understand what is happening on this um, in, with this issue. And this paper is really a part of that sort of body of work. Next slide. So um, to do this work, um, we have a clearinghouse of parcel level administrative data, um, and we use uh, files from the Cook County Assessor uh, looking at two points in time. So in 2013, sort of what is the universe of two to four unit buildings? And then we trace them into 2019 to figure out what happened. And if, it, if the building was still two to four, we kind of categorized it that way. We also identified changes um, and created sort of a, a typology um, of those changes by tax class. Now, what we know from our research at DePaul is that um, really geographic variation is really important, right? Not only to understand kind of the patterns and understand what's happening, but also as we sort of think about policy solutions, um, the different types of markets become important as we think to, you know, not only develop, but implement policy. So we had developed in previous years an analysis derived from parcel level data on deeds, um, property characteristics, um, and other data sets to aggregate and create kind of a, a lens of affordability in the city. So um, how do we understand the city by tract of high cost, moderate cost, and lower cost neighborhoods? And being able to understand what happened to this sort of loss supply through that lens um, was really one of the elements of this paper. So next slide, please. This is a map um, of the city of Chicago. Um, just from orientation purposes on my right, so depending on what you're looking at, but on the right is the lakefront to the east. Um, high cost neighborhoods are shaded in red, moderate cost neighborhoods are in that kind of taupe greenish color, and then the lightest color 
our lower cost communities. So this is sort of the city um, from the lens of affordability. It's our neighborhood housing market typology. Um, and between 2013 and 2019, we lost about over 4,800 parcels in two to four unit buildings representing about 12,000 units. And this next slide, is what that looks like, those parcels uh, mapped on the city. And I think one thing that stands out to me, or I'll name two things, but one thing is that, you know, we're looking at this, at these parcels, you see that we're losing two to fours all over the city, but that loss is most concentrated um, in high cost communities um, on the north side of the city by the lakefront. Next slide. So another way to sort of think about this is, you know, what share of, the stock was lost in different neighborhoods. And between in, between 2013 and 2019 in the city, uh, there was a 4.2% loss in the 2013 stock of two to fours. Um, but that this shows you that when we look at it through the lens of market, we know we see that the loss is most acute in high cost neighborhoods. So 7.1% of the stock was lost um, in high cost neighborhoods, 3.5% of the stock was lost in lower cost communities, and 1.8% of the stock was lost in moderate cost neighborhoods. Next slide. So two to fours are lost for different reasons. Um, this is looking on the one side, sort of the composition of loss um, by parcels, and on the other side is units on the right. And there are two sort of major pathways for lost two to fours. One is that they were replaced by a single family home. This is either the two to four was demolished and a single family home was built, or the two to four was gutted and became a single unit. So that would be a conversion. The other is 30% of that loss was um, replaced by non-residential land use. Um, and there are some shifts depending on what that looks like in different communities, but that's often vacant land. 13.4% um, were replaced by another residential property use. So this is like you add a unit, right? You have a four unit building, you maybe add a basement unit, it becomes a five unit building. So still in the, in the stock, um, but just a change like that. And then another 9.5% <clears throat> were re disappeared. So the PIN disappeared, parcel identification number. And these were, when we went and looked at them, were, were most often because a condominium was developed. Um, the building was demolished and a condo was built. Next slide. So the market context becomes very important to understanding this loss two flat. So if we're thinking about like these two pathways, two central pathways for loss, um, on the left, we have the share of, the, of all of the single family homes, uh, sort of all the two to fours lost to single family homes, what percentage of them were in high, moderate, or low cost communities. And on the right, we have of all two to fours lost to non-residential land use, what percentage of them are in high, moderate, and low cost communities. And this again just shows, one, that, you know, again, we know that there's this concentration in high cost neighborhoods, but there's a very much a high a concentration in the type of activity. So 78% of um, two to fours that were lost to single family homes were in high cost neighborhoods. Um, and then conversely, 65.2% uh, of lost two to fours lost to non-residential land use were in low co lower cost neighborhoods in the city of Chicago. Next slide. This is a map that's looking just aggregated census tract level, two to fours lost to single family land use. And so, so we had already seen what this looks like in parcels, right? We'd all already looked at sort of the shifts in sort of the overall stock. Um, and this shows that this is this kind of phenomenon um, is not only concentrated in high cost neighborhoods, but it's just particularly concentrated in specific places um, on the north side. And these are neighborhoods that are amenity rich, close to transit, close to the lakefront. They've got great schools. Um, these are neighborhoods that are dense, um, that don't have a lot of single family stock, but that have recent growth and in, in demand from high income households. Um, with often with families. So we've noted that these two things. And so within, if we aggregate to City of Chicago community area, which is an amalgam of tracks and sort of those broader outlines, more than 50% of all two to fours lost to single family homes were just in five City of Chicago neighborhoods. Next slide. So this is looking at the share of lost two to fours to non-residential land use. Again, showing that we have a concentration in low cost communities, but um, you can see that it's a little bit less geographically concentrated, that there's some lost uh, two to fours to non-residential land use in other places. Um, in lower cost communities of sort of the lost to non-residential land use, 90 plus percent of those were vacant land. And when we track them from this study from 2019 into the most recent tax year, 96% of them are still vacant. 
um, versus when we look at sort of that uh, two to four loss to non-residential land use or vacant land in any other community, um, like a high cost neighborhood, just 43% of those are still vacant land. So when we look at sort of this non-residential typology in non-lower cost communities, one, it tends to be sort of like a less of a permanent status, right? It might be sort of a de development sort of in the development cycle, it might be demolished and then we track it and we see it in 2019 as vacant, but then it's now built. And often when it was built, a single family home was built on that property. Um, and the other is that we just see some side lots there too. Next slide. So for policymakers looking to develop policies that not only sort of incentivize investment in the stock, but also are preserving the stock, the sort of understanding the challenges and the pressures in different markets becomes really important. Um, and so in higher cost neighborhoods, I had noted that we have really increased demand for single family homes, with limited supply in the communities where this is happening. And that's putting pressure to convert older two to four year buildings to single family homes and demo some of those buildings um, to replace them with often very high cost luxury, large single family homes. Now the stock is not static. So we did note some uh, that some two to fours were brought online during this period, not enough to replace what we lost, the 4,800 parcels. And really notably, and you could just sort of just, this would be just just logic, right? <laughs> that anything built would be unlikely to be affordable. And so we tried to find different ways of measuring that. And we looked at assessed value and, and these were, you know, high assessed value properties. So just again, this idea that once we, that these properties are kind of a natural resource, right? They're providing affordability, relative affordability, this gentle density, um, this missing middle, but when we lose them, uh, they're very difficult to replace and, and certainly not able to be replaced um, with uh, affordable housing often. So in moderate cost communities were the areas where they seem to be most stable. Um, and um, what we are losing two to four unit buildings often um, to sort of single family homes when we do see them. Um, and they're, they're occurring in very specific markets that are close to uh, transit, that are close to high cost communities, um, and so, or close to planned investment or investment is occurring. So again, the gentrification typology sort of applies here. And in lower cost communities, um, these are neighborhoods that have high levels of foreclosure distress, vacancy and abandonment. And that means that many two to four unit buildings are lost to or threatened by deterioration and demolition. And when we looked, um, we also linked lost two to fours to foreclosure filings, historic foreclosure filings, and found that foreclosure with a common pathway um, uh, that we may be losing these buildings. So this suggests again, sort of the role of housing and security here um, in the lost two to fours. In the last slide. Um, so these findings highlight the need for not only sort of a comprehensive um, approach uh, to dealing with these challenges, um, that's really thinking not only about sort of the value of these buildings, but also the unique market context that could be giving us insights into the challenges, but also the potential um, policy solutions to address this loss. Um, and that really just comes down to the importance of preservation, right, in different market contexts. Because again, once we lose these buildings, um, we lose them likely forever. And then in lower cost markets, um, I think that was really important is just the understanding that this is not, this is a phenomenon that's associated with a, hist a history of disinvestment. Um, and so really thinking about comprehensive community development strategies to really reverse the tide of long-term population loss, historic in dis disinvestment, and the ongoing legacies of both foreclosure crisis, Great Recession, and most re recently the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Great. Uh, we got a couple questions here in the chat. One would be uh, how you identify a conversion from a two to four to a single family structure using the data. Great. Um, so do you, did you mean a conversion? Well, I'll tell I'll just, since I probably can't ask the person specifically what they meant, um, I will um, answer it in, in two ways. So we have tax class. Um, and so the tax class would indicate like a 213 or two. 12 in the city of Chicago is, um, or in Cook County, is a two to four unit building. Um, it's actually technically a two to six, but we used other data to get back to, to isolate specifically the two to four. Um, and when we are looking at tax class changes, we are just noting uh, that we have a, um, a data dictionary from the Cook County Assessor that tells us that these are single family homes. Um, and then often they're, um, they're they're identified by age or that there's a bunch of different tax classes, but they're all single family. And so we were able to use that to be able to isolate that specific use. 
That's great. Uh, another question. question. Yeah. Another question uh, of our APTU members. Jennifer said, I remember when wetlands prevented building on some of those sites. You can see some of them being developed now. Can this data also be used by environmentalists? That's an interesting question. Um, I'd have to think about that. I mean, I think, I think the, so we've used these data in a couple ways, right? So we've looked at, um, and, and one of the things we've been tooling around with is updating it. So understanding sort of through the lens of, you know, the post-COVID economy, what's happened, you know, since 2019. And so, you know, we've, we can use these data because we get the, we get annually updated data from the assessor to be able to understand changes. Um, and presumably you could use it to understand really any kind of changes um, in the built environment. Um, we looked, one thing that we're looking at, for example, is just vacant land. So pervasive vacant land, um, the vacant land that has sat um, for 20 plus years um, in some communities. So we have data from deeds to be able to understand that, you know, the property um, characteristics of the property um, in terms of uh, sales activity and how people are buying properties and are they businesses or investors. Um, and we've been trying to understand sort of the development on vacant land and where we're seeing development and where we're not. Um, and it, this is a critical data set for that as well. Um, so I think you could, uh, but I uh, would have to think about some specific policy questions that um, might be important to kind of think about to help guide that development because the data can be a little tricky to interpret. Uh, another question in here. Uh, have you seen policies in other localities that seem to reduce the loss of these small multis? Are there any exemplars in protecting this type of housing? That's a great question. I mean, I think, uh, so this kind of relates, I think, to some of our kind of future research questions on this, because I think the, the so typically when we're thinking about what, well, what is eroding this lower cost stock, right? You have demand from high income households and in, in this, at least in the gentrification typology, right? That are putting pressure on this stock in areas where you don't have a lot of supply of single family homes. So, but what is kind of occurring behind that is, you know, the ownership um, turnover, right? You've got turnover in a market. Um, and so I think, you know, you have, it's, it's likely that the lower cost rental stock is held in long-term owned buildings um, in neighborhoods. So how can we understand what are the challenges and issues facing long-term owners that might lead them to sell? Um, and, uh, you know, obviously you can't prevent folks from selling, but are they selling because, for example, property taxes went up um, and they need to sell the property? Um, can they not get um, lower cost uh, you know, credit in order to be able to invest in the property. Um, what are the ways in which we can think about um, really understanding the challenges that uh, long-term owners might have and how can we um, meet those challenges with good policy solutions so that we can have that kind of stability in a neighborhood? So I think that they've seen certain things like um, property tax uh, incentives. So can we think of long-term owner incentives? Can we think of incentives that are specific to the stock. If there's a way, I think, to keep, um, to think about for, to, to incentivize um, maybe a property tax reduction on properties that are affordable or relatively affordable. Um, there's also been outright kind of through um, ordinances, for example, to um, keep density. Um, and in Chicago, for example, there have been efforts to, um, to create limitations, particularly around transit, um, that sort of disincentivize uh, the uh, reduction of density. And that is often going to look like um, the, the reduction of and the, the disappearance of this particular stock. There's another question in the chat. Uh, I would appreciate it if you would answer that. Uh, but right now, thank you for your sure. talk. And we are gonna turn it over to Max. Thank you. Hello. Hi. So um, I'm Max Griswold. I'm a policy researcher for Rand Corporation, and I'm going to be presenting today on work analyzing the effect of crime-free housing policies on complete evictions using spatial first differences. Um, I conducted this work with my colleagues Lawrence Baker, Sarah B. Hunter, Jason Ward, and Cheng Ren from the University of Albany. So next slide. So uh, I'm going to really briefly talk about uh, the policy context of why why we decided to to research this and um, 
why we think uh, there might be an effect here. So this policy is building out of a history of extending the responsibility of landlords and managing the behavior of their tenants, specifically to abate criminal activity. So starting late 1970s, uh, cities and states began experimenting with compelling landlords to take actions to abate the disorderly conduct or criminal activities of their tenants. This was codified through a series of laws into public housing, starting with the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986, which could hold landlords liable uh, if they do not abate the drug-related criminal activities of their tenants, which was extended further to definition of drug-related crimes, and then further to activities that occurred on or off the pro uh, premise, um, then further into more private uh, landlord relationships through applying to housing voucher recipients, and then further to the behavior of guests and their tenants. Next slide. Uh, could you go? Great. So um, crime-free housing came out of these series of laws and cited uh, the justification of those laws for extending this into private landlord relationships. And so this policy was started by um, an individual, uh, a police officer in the Mesa, Arizona Police Department, who started an organization called the International Crime Free Association, which markets uh, this policy to municipalities. And you can see here examples of some of the um, branding that you use for this program, um, starting in 1995. And uh, next slide. And the policy has since spread to around about 2,000 municipalities in the USA. And our specific study, we've been investigating this policy just within the state of California. So on the map here, I display all of the locations with one of these policies. Um, there's about 104 in the state. Um, and these have been steadily increasing in, in their adoption since 1995. Um, next slide. So crime-free housing policies are implemented by police departments and include three primary components. So uh, the first is police departments train landlords who are enrolled in the program in ways they can screen tenants for criminal activity to uh, end. The goal of all of these policies is to reduce criminal activity in multifamily housing properties. And so these trainings are kind of aimed at screening tenants um, to ensure that uh, individuals who may commit a crime in the future are not accepted for tenancy. Um, then uh, once uh, landlords have completed that training, they need to make uh, changes to the built environment within their unit um, for the purposes of uh, crime prevention, following what's called crime prevention through environmental design standards. So this includes trimming hedges, adding lighting to common spaces, dead bolting doors. And then the last component is enrolled landlords in a program now have to add a supplemental lease agreement, which, um, and I'll show you that on the next slide. Um, thanks which basically states a uh, tenant it can be evicted from their unit for, for essentially uh, any criminal activity. And the definition of criminal activity is pretty broad. Um, and uh, these leases are very standard. We found across all the jurisdictions who looked at, they uh, do not need to involve an arrest. Um, they just need to have a preponderance of evidence that someone is engaged in some form of criminal activity, which could include things like disorderly conduct, and typically applies to both the guests of that house, and it does not require it to be criminal activity that occurred on the premise. And so the International Crime Free Association describes this as kind of the heart of the implementation strategy. And so the purpose of our study was to see, given that eviction is the primary means of uh, enforcing this policy, is this leading to an increase in eviction in cities which have implemented crime-free housing? Uh, next slide. Um, so to evaluate this, we needed to get data both on evictions and on a policy effect. And so kind of fitting in the themes of local data for local action, we obtained um, sub-municipal level indicators on evictions. This was difficult to obtain in California because records are sealed across the state as part of AB 2819. And so there's not any data available on evictions below the county level. So we use public act record requests to obtain geocoded eviction data at the address level. And that's what I'm displaying here in the background of map is the amount of evictions that are occurring in block groups. So block groups are about 1,000 to 1,500 people and they're um, usually a pretty small area within cities. And so we obtained a large amount of records for uh, requests uh, that we submitted to 58 different sheriff's departments. And then we used a um, machine learning vision algorithm to pull up the data because a lot of these forms included um, 
retracted uh, line items basically by sheriffs um, from evictions that had been canceled. And then we translated that into a panel data set. We also submitted public act requests to cities to obtain implementing um, buildings that were enrolled in their crime-free housing. And so you can see the triangles there are buildings that were enrolled in a program. So we submitted this to all of the municipalities we were able to in the state. Um, unfortunately, because of the eviction moratoria, many cities had suspended the policy during that time period. And so we were asking for retrospective um, enrollment in a program in 2019. And we received responses from four locations that actually maintained that data and the rest were not able to provide us. So we uh, accordingly analyzed these four locations. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. So we only had data from 2018 and really 2019 to play with, along with those four sites. And so a conventional strategy that's used in policy evaluations, and I'll try to move quickly here, and I really would recommend folks read the paper if they want a better understanding on the um, causal inference strategy we're taking here. But uh, the general idea is we weren't able to use difference to difference because we didn't have a long enough panel data series to apply to strategy. So if we're trying to estimate a causal effect, one approach we could take is just using a very well-adjusted regression design. And so I like this image from uh, Druck and Miller saying, and I'll kind of walk you through what this is showing to demonstrate why we took the specific strategy we did. So if we use just a conventional regression, where on the left-hand side, we have the amount of evictions that occurred. On the right-hand side, we have specific observations in this instance block groups, and we just included a ton of different controls to ensure we're only estimating the policy effect and not say some other policy that was implemented at the same time. But well, we then have to take on an assumption that any given treated unit is comparable to every other control unit. And so displayed in the figure is the comparisons we'd be making. So we'd be saying for unit one, this is comparable to all other units in our data set. So this tends to be an unreasonable assumption and why um, people tend to not believe you can estimate causal effects of regression because this is such a broad assumption without a substantial number of controls for all of the different reasons. These different units could be um, different uh, in addition to the policy. And so one strategy that's commonly taken, like I said, is difference in difference. So the idea here is we're going to subtract neighboring units in time so that we're removing variation that is time invariant, things that are not changing from time period to time period by just subtracting the two units. So the idea here is who I am tomorrow is more comparable to who I am today than who I was 10 years ago. And so if I subtract these two units, we're left with making comparisons just on that line there. We're comparing the immediate unit next to each other in time. So unit one to two, two to three, so on and so forth. We'll then use those differences to compare treated and control units. So this works really well when we have panel data. But often, and really for local housing data, it might not be possible to get a panel of data at, at a le great level of granularity. So one plausible way that you can make fair comparisons is looking at immediately neighboring areas. So the idea here is my neighborhood block two blocks away is more similar to my block than on the other side of the city. And so we need to come up with some way of figuring out which units are neighboring sites then subtract them so that we're only looking at comparisons on that diagonal there. Uh, next slide. So to do that, we had to come up uh, and we use uh, using Dr. Miller saying an algorithm for determining neighbors, but there's some ambiguity in how you determine neighboring sites within a city and we needed to incorporate that fact. So here I'm displaying the city of Riverside and trying to describe how we just constructed our spatial neighbors. So basically we used an algorithm where I kept the map um, kind of looking like Riverside looks conventionally on, you know, if you went on Google Maps and we just chose the top left corner and we tried to draw the longest line possible of connecting up neighboring block groups. And we kept doing this until we've created, and I've shown you the first three uh, lines of which would have been about 20 all of the neighbors relative to that specific angle. And then we did this again for uh, every other possible angle uh, in our um, set. Next slide, and I'll try to move uh, concretely here. So we got a lot of potential effects based on the angle and the neighbors we had. We summarized those into an overall effect. Next slide, results. 
So when we looked at just the uh, descriptive analysis for sites, we found that walk groups with crime-free housing policies had much lower per capita income, higher Latin and Hispanic populations, higher black populations. Next slide. And the results from our estimator, when we summed up all of those results across angles, showed a really consistent effect. Much larger change in executive evictions within sites, around 25%. Uh, next slide. So we found there's a dramatic increase in number of evictions in block groups that have crime-free housing sites, and that these block groups tend to have lower incomes in larger Black and Hispanic populations in a general city. Next slide. And so uh, based on this, we recommend that local governments should reconsider maintaining or adopting crime-free housing policies, in particular in light of other information demonstrating they have a limited effect on crime and may also lead to increased rates of homelessness, more drug overdoses, and higher intimate partner homicides um, from other research. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm going to ask you a question. Um, what were the key challenges using the data sets that you guys had for your research? So I think really finding the right estimator to fit the available data. And I think that's why we landed on spatial first differences as a procedure, because we really needed to analyze this policy within the context of cities. And that required really detailed data. And so actually getting the data, which we basically got lots of letters and forms from sheriff's departments that we then needed to hand scan and translate into a you know, machine readable format was a huge undertaking. We received around 50,000 documents. It was a lot of scanning. The documents sometimes were rotated incorrectly based on how they've been scanned by the sheriff's department. So there's a ton of work behind uh, the scenes of this paper to really process that data into a usable format. And I think that was a, a very significant um, undertaking. Can, can you describe the any areas of future research that would build upon this to help understand the broader impact of those crime-free housing policies? Yeah, absolutely. So um, as part of the ongoing work, we're trying to look at some of the more distal effects of crime-free housing and also the relationship in other sites between crime-free housing and specific crime types. Uh, so we've been trying to disaggregate and see if, is there an effect not just on total crime rates uh, or violent crime rates, but on say disorderly conduct, which is another potential place this policy could intervene. And we're also trying to look at other locations such as in Ohio or Illinois, um, given that the policy is, is uh, so um, um, widespread across the United States. What about your method? Is that translatable? Like, how does the method that you use, how could that inform other policy analyses at the neighborhood level? I think this method would be a phenomenal approach for a lot of other individuals looking at um, effects within uh, municipalities. So this could be really useful for looking at the effect of, say, zoning or any other uh, treatment that occurs just within city blocks. And so you could even apply this in, say, a health context for when there were mobile health clinics within a city to see the kind of their local area effect. And so anytime there is more uh, below the municipal level effects, it, there really isn't data that's going back, say, 20 years that allow you to use these panel data estimators. And so it seems really plausible to then take instead these close spatial neighbors, apply a very similar approach to these common policy evaluation methods, and then estimate this when we have little data repeating across years. And so I think this could really widely apply to uh, housing research beyond this context. Great. Thank you. All right, there is a question in the chat. Uh, do you think that algorithms like used are a sufficient solution to opaque or unavailable administrative data, or do local governments still have a responsibility to make local data more available? I absolutely do not believe this is sufficient, and I wish we could have had more data. This came out of a data issue, which could be resolved by municipalities providing better reporting on their data. And that's the real solution here, is how can we make sure that municipalities and states are providing more robust statistics on eviction? Um, there's very little data. Uh, eviction Lab and other organizations have done great work to provide more uh, comparable data across the US, but it's still not at a sufficient level of detail where we can really analyze these policy effects concretely. And I think uh, municipalities could really improve the reporting here. And it's not just for eviction, it's for a range of municipal outcomes because it's very difficult to get any municipal data um, 
for, for a lot of different indicators in a way you can compare across sites. Um, some cities are doing a great job, but uh, I think if there's some centralized reporting mechanism that could really improve our ability to do policy evaluations. Great. Thank you. Uh, there's another uh, article in the issue by one of your California neighbors, uh, Tim Thomas and company. They were talking about the difficulty they had extracting data from these eviction records and doing the text mining in order to pull the information to make it available for research. So it's great to see all of the work being done to digitize and make that information accessible for policy research. So thank you very much. Great. All right, so I wanna thank everyone for being with us today and to especially thank our wonderful speakers. Uh, I think this has been a great indication of how you can use administrative data to look at pol housing policy and housing adjacent policy. And I encourage everybody to take a look at the other papers that are in the spring issue of Cityscape. Uh, and also before you sign off, I would invite you to take a moment to fill out our very short survey data people that will pop up on your screen. Uh, and your feedback is really helpful as we develop more content and generate more webinars like this. Uh, if there are any other questions, uh, feel free to pop them in the chat and also uh, feel free to potentially put your questions on LinkedIn and we can see if our authors would be willing to keep answering questions. And we just stuck the link to the full issue in the chat and I invite everybody to take a look at that. And thank you for joining us today.